Here at Fully Charged Live, there's a huge number of different vehicle technologies on display. We've got the big class eight electric trucks downstairs, buses, all of that goodness. We've got a vintage 1900s Detroit electric to my right. And I'm here with some really cool electric bike technology. As you know, we are big fans of electric bikes here on the channel. It's important to make sure that everybody has access to clean, green, equitable transportation. And e-bikes are a great affordable way of getting onto the electric vehicle bandwagon, improving cardiovascular health, getting people outside. E-bikes can also help build communities because you're not inside this big hunk of metal. You can interact with people as you are riding along the road. And of course, you can reduce congestion too. E-bikes and e-bike technology have come a long way in the last couple of years, but I am here to discuss a first for e-bikes. This might look like a regular e-bike, but it's actually got some very interesting technology in it. And to tell us about it is Michael. Michael, introduce your company and the technology you have. Hello, so we are Charge Bike, a fairly new company. And we have invented what we are sure that's going to come to basically all of the e-bikes motors. And hopefully down the road, e-motorcycles and e-cars. So in the e-bike industry, all of the motors are either a direct drive motor or a geared motor. Direct drive motors can regenerate when you're braking, but they cannot free will. And the geared motors can free will, but they cannot regenerate. So if you do regenerate, you necessarily introduce a drag into the system because of the cogging of the magnets. And we are the first ones uh, who were able to overcome this issue and have a bike that is completely 100% freewheeling like a normal bike would. Right, yeah, yeah. But you can also apply the brake and you get braking, which 100% regenerates. And that's a world first. And the cool thing about this technology is, as you were explaining earlier, it reduces friction losses in the system. Exactly, exactly. It makes it more pleasant to ride. And it means that you can uh, regenerate when you're going downhill, but you also have the added benefit of being able to apply the brake independently of the regenerative braking that's going back into the battery pack. So it's almost like a blended braking system exactly, that you don't exactly. have to date on most e-bikes. So what's happening until now in all of the vehicles is that the braking system and the motor system are two separate systems. And our system is the first one, which the braking is part of the motor system. So again, you get the freewheeling and you get the regeneration. And what's also nice, we call this true fill. Unlike the other system where you have sensors on the levers or you need special equipment, our system does not have any sensors to it. It can work with whatever component you'd like to use, Shimano, whatever. And the thing is that you only apply the brake and your actual force that you're applying to the brake will be the actual force that's used in order to stop the wheel. And the way we did this is that the disc brake is now connected in between the motor and the wheel. And that's what allows us to solve this issue. So basically you can see that when I'm, when I'm driving the bike, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see this, the disc is not moving. And that's a world first. You've never seen a vehicle You've never seen a vehicle where the disc is not directly connected to the wheel. In terms of manufacture, obviously right. e-bike motor design and manufacturing has improved right. incredibly over the last decade or so. Yeah. We're now seeing motors that are more energy efficient. We're seeing motors that produce less heat, which right. is a, a big challenge for those old yeah. early electric uh, motors for e-bikes. They made a lot of excess heat. They were inefficient. The right. more heat you produce, the more inefficient the motor is. What changes to manufacturing right, right. is so, required to produce this? Right, so a good question. And uh, a lot of questions that we get is, all right, is it pricier? Does it add a lot of material? Is it, you know, does it weigh more, right? So that's expected. So the beauty of it is it does not weigh more and it does not add any complexity to the system. It does add a little bit of cost, but not too much of a complexity. It's a very simple system and that's the beauty of it. In terms of the actual physical connections, I'm right. guessing that the, the disc 
the rotor is actually held on a carrier plate exactly, exactly. that is permanently connected to the insides right, of the right, motor. Right, exactly. So to, to elaborate on this, on this a little bit more. So what's happening in all of the motors, and that's not related to us, what's happening on all of the geared motors is that you have a planetary gear set that's connected to the output of the motor. Now, until now, the disc brake was connected to the wheel, obviously. But what we did is we connected the disc brake to the planet carrier, which is in fact, is in, like I said, in between the output of the motor and the wheel. And this allows us that when you activate the brake, you're actually using the brake for two things. One of them is actually you are actually applying force that will stop the brake. You will stop the wheel, but you're also engaging a clutch. So now the disc is also a clutch. And when I apply the brake, the motor now joins. But what I do not apply the brake, the motor does not turn, and this is why you get the free wheeling system without any drag. Zero drag into the system. And in terms of, you know, in terms of retrofitability, yeah. this can be fitted to any size wheel. Right, so more than that, this could be fitted to any type of motor. So that's very nice. And in terms of retrofitting your bikes, so we have green technologies here, and Justin will tell us more about it in a second, uh, but you can do it in any bike. You can, of course, come with a new bike, obviously, uh, and we hope it does with all of the motor manufacturers, but with green technologies, you can buy equipment to retrofit whatever bike you're using and you love, right? And it has you covered with everything you need, motors, batteries, and controllers, etc. In terms of motor size i know right now you're right. focusing on e-bikes right but you you dropped a big hint earlier you're hoping that this can yeah. upscale into motorcycle technology exactly. as well right. is there an upper limit to motor size for this no so what's nice about there's no limit at all and what's nice is that motorcycles uh when we've, they've gone electric so they do allow you to regenerate because they are using a, mostly a direct drive motor but they induce this drag. And more, worse than that, they don't have the true feeling sensation. So when you're braking, again, a sensor on the lever is what actually trying to understand what you're trying to do, but it cannot understand exactly how much you want to brake. So it gives you this and this amount of braking. And if you press a little bit harder, it tries to give you more braking, but it will never be as the human brain does it automatically. So with our invention, you just drive as you used to drive and you apply the brakes normally. There's no buttons, there's no switches, and the brake just acts the same. So we're actually using a, a mechanical solution right. to give us an analog braking feel exactly. as opposed to electromechanical exactly. with any actuation or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, in general, yeah. In terms of maintenance, is this yeah. cheaper to maintain? No, it's, it's, all, it's exactly the same to maintain. So it's not cheaper, but it's not more expensive as well. Cool. And right. tell me uh, what is lying in the future for you guys in terms of all right, where so, you go from here? All right, so uh, we wanted to start with bikes, first of all, because we love bikes. Uh, I myself am a motorcycle rider as well, so I'm eager to bring this to the motorcycle industry as well. And we are also in contact with some of the big companies in order to bring this to cars as well. Of course, this will take more time, uh, more complexity to it, uh, but we hope this is coming to 100% of the bike motors and the motorcycle motors very quickly. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michael. Right. I'm going to be uh, chatting to uh, Justin, uh, uh, a Justin from, uh, from Green Technologies. Not connected, but you are working together on are, this particular project. Right, exactly. So we are working together in order to bring our technology uh, to the first motor. This motor is going to come to the market hopefully by the end of the year, uh, but very, very soon in any case. And we are doing this with Green Technologies Motors first, uh, and there will be other partners down the road. So, having talked to the lovely people at Charge Bike, we're now literally next door. It's, the, I guess, the same stand. But we're here with Green Technologies and its founder, Justin, who's going to tell me about some of the cool things that he's done over the years with e-bikes. Now, we're standing in the Green Technologies personal museum of e-bike e technology, yeah. the e-museum. <laughs> Thanks for, for, for talking oh. to me today, Justin. Tell me about it. My delight. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so when I was in university in the 2000 to 2004 era, um, I had a super steep hill to get up to get to campus. And as I was riding that at 8 in the morning, trying to get to my morning classes, I was constantly thinking, my goodness, I just wish I had something to assist and boost me up the hill. And that's when I started looking online and found that there was actually an emerging burgeoning community of people retrofitting bikes to electric assist and discovered that there was a whole world of do-it-yourself hackers trying to bring that 
concept into something viable for themselves. So this is before there was much commercial e-bikes on the market and they were largely unheard of in North America. Uh, so we started an electric bike club in that point and then started retrofitting our own bikes and to the amazement of everyone, when they would hop on it, they would just have their mind blown, think this is crazy, this is the future, how come there aren't e-bikes everywhere? And it seemed to me like a destiny that e-bikes were soon gonna take over as being one of the most preferred methods of mobility in in the cities and kind of everywhere. Um, but while doing that, we also got excited about all other modes of transport. So as you know, young 20s guys, we were all into skateboarding and longboarding, and the idea of motorizing skateboards had exactly that same kind of appeal. And on a bicycle, you know, it adds a lot of utility to get up the hills to go faster. On a skateboard, you're really limited that you don't have a built-in braking system, and kicking a board up a hill is almost futile because you lose your momentum so quickly. So the motor really elevated skateboarding to a whole different dimension of practicality by giving you controlled braking and controlled movement up even the steepest of hills. Uh, so we started building projects back then thinking, I mean, it's a, like a playground <laughs> of, uh, of possibilities. And while we were doing that, we were just exploring all the different ways of controlling and manipulating electric vehicles to really feel a, the human hybrid sense of how are you controlling the bike. On a typical on a bike, you would have a throttle that you would push. And on a skateboard, you'd also have a handheld remote. Um, but as we've seen in the evolution of e-bikes, there's been a real big trend towards bionic type of controls, where it actually senses the force that you're applying to the pedals and just organically adds power to the motor so that you feel much more connected to the vehicle that you're riding. Um, and we had a similar idea with the skateboarding front, where when you're riding a skateboard, if you have a, a trigger controlled skateboard, if you just hit the trigger, you're going to flip over backwards because of vehicle accelerates under your feet. So the first thing you have to do is lean forwards in order to brace yourself for that impending acceleration. And we thought, well, couldn't we just take the cue that the person's leaning as a sign that the skateboard should accelerate. And similarly, when you're about to brake on a skateboard, if you just apply the brake, you're going to fall over forwards because the board stops underneath you. So you have to lean back. And so in our skateboard experiments, we started adding weight sensors to the trucks of the skateboard so that it can sense where the rider's weight is distributed over top of the board and then control the skateboard based solely on that weight. More weight on the front, it accelerates, shift your weight to the back, and it brakes. Um, and that same control also worked. I mean, part, part of what endeared us to that control was building self-balancing projects. So at that time, there was a whole bunch of hype in the media about Dean Kamen and this Segway invention that was going to revolutionize the world. It faced a ton of ridicule. Of course, a lot of people thought it looked incredibly dorky, but the core idea of a balancing mobility vehicle seemed inspiring, and it was inspired, and it was very novel. Um, and take the form factor out of it, we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to have something that was as fun to ride as a board, but use that two-wheeled balancing concept? Uh, so we built our first balancing skateboard in 2004 here, um, and it had fulfilled every imaginable capability that we had. You would lean forwards to accelerate, lean back to brake. You would steer by just pushing forwards or back like you steer a normal skateboard. And then you could do pirouettes on the spot. So for navigating around campus, when there are class changes, you're dealing with swarms of people. A normal skateboard has a super large turning radius that makes it kind of awkward where you're hopping off to avoid these big uh, hordes of pedestrians. Uh, but with this device, you actually had immediate on the spot mobility. Um, and it always seemed to me that there was you know, an enormous potential for a compact, lightweight personal transporter that didn't have the like dorky awkwardness of standing fours, but rode like a skateboard. Um, and so over time, we built projects like that. But in the world of running a business, um, you end up getting very preoccupied with the, right? the mechanical <laughs> aspects of that. Um, and at the same time, we started an electric bike club. We started uh, getting motor systems for people to convert their bikes to electric. Uh, and then that became the, the essence of Grin Technologies, offering systems for people with non-electric bikes to convert them. Um, and then these projects that have remained little side things that we had less and less time to further explore, um, but that showcase what we're seeing now, which is uh, an urban landscape that's filled of innovative micromobility devices that weren't on anyone's radar 20 years ago. So Grin Technologies now sells a lot of of kits and provides assistance to anybody who wants to electrify anything. Pretty much. So and our, you've our, got <laughs> everything from an electric wheelbarrow here yeah. to tandem trikes. You've got a cargo bike behind you. Yeah. We are big advocates of right to repair at the channel. Mm -hmm. And we believe it's really important if you're going to use something to learn how it works and mm -hmm. to be able to work on it yourself, because that is a great way of ensuring that you can continue to use that yeah. vehicle, that product for a really long period of yeah. time. 
Tell me about how important it is to empower end users to work on their own vehicles. You hit on such an important point that's so core to our principles here. Um, and that's one of the things that's rather annoyed me about the development of e-bikes. As we've seen e-bikes hit a huge mainstream audience, they've really gravitated towards fully integrated proprietary systems using non-standardized components and, uh, and parts that are only serviced and supported by the manufacturer. And these manufacturers don't, live, don't survive very long. So the reality is, having been been in this space for 20 years, I'd say the average life of an e-bike company is maybe three to five years, but the average life of a bicycle is going on 30, 40 years. You see all kinds of people riding retro bikes from the 70s and 80s that still work to this day. And from our perspective, there's no reason why e-bikes couldn't embrace that same philosophy. Uh, so when you do a retrofit on your own bike, you're using parts that are intrinsically open standard. You can use any battery pack. You can get your battery from us or from anywhere else. If we're no longer around in five years, you can continue to use your system. And by putting it together, your you're now actually aware of how those components work and what you can do to upgrade them and replace them down the road. Uh, and it's been one of the most endearing things to us is to have repeat customers that bought a kit from us 18 years ago and they've now maybe on their third battery iteration, they've upgraded from a throttle control to a torque sensor, um, but they've continued to have that same platform functioning and it will continue to function decades into the future. Um, and from my perspective, that's what we need for a healthy ecosystem, both environmentally, um, but also as an end use consumer. It's really no fun being at the mercy of corporate control on the products that you think you own. And so being able to mod, hack, upgrade your thing is, is core to what e-bikes should be. And of course, if you understand how the bike works, if you understand how the technology works, when things do go wrong, you are You're so able much to more self-reliant to fix it. And that's another problem that's faced a lot of e-bike owners is that the moment there's a troubleshooting issue, um, they themselves, having not put it together, aren't aware where to look for those points where there could have been a broken connection, there could have been you know, a sensor that's come loose, uh, and the bike stores that sold it, they also didn't assemble it or put it together, so they don't have that awareness either. And there's a huge shortage across the world right now of people who are skilled in the realm of e-bike repair, e-bike technicians. It's just not a thing. Um, and it's left a lot of people really stranded and frustrated in their e-bike ownership experience. It's also important to note that a lot of e-bikes that come to market today are not suitable for everyone. There's some electric tricycles out there. Mm -hmm. There are some electric bicycles out there, but the big trend in the e-bike world is electric fat tire bicycles, <laughs> which are yeah. great if you want a weekend fun yeah. thing, but they're not good for commuting. Yeah. They're not always accessible. If you have a hand cranked mm -hmm. bike or trike, you need to have a bespoke solution that works for you. Mm -hmm. And while there are companies out there who will charge you a couple of grand to build one from scratch, mm -hmm. being able to work on your own vehicle and design your own system can actually save you a lot of money as well, right? It most certainly can. And th that addressed another thing that the, yeah, in the, we, so one of the things we did recently is we added a, a project gallery to our website where our customers would upload the neat items that they made. And what endeared me so much was just how many original out of the box. So there's hand cycles, velomobiles, an enormous amount of people doing solar bikes. Uh, so solar panels now are at a point where the cost and weight makes them actually viable for doing long distance touring. Um, but you can't retrofit a solar system on a factory bike. So in that DIY realm, it's much easier to integrate other sources of power into the drive system um, and also enabling a host of unconventional vehicles that address mobility needs um, and, uh, and again, uh, like recumbent bicycles, trikes, those ones don't attract a mainstream manufacturer and a retrofit kit enables the electrification of those more niche vehicles. 20 years is a long time to be working in the e-bike industry. I myself got into electric vehicles 2006. I think we're about the same age because <laughs> when you were cycling up hills here in BC, I was cycling through London as a music student at university. And that's how I really discovered, I mean, I've always been a cyclist, but cycling through London taught me so much about the independence that having your own mm -hmm. two wheel vehicle can bring. Mm -hmm. It's faster, it's quicker, it's more efficient, you stay healthy. There's been a lot of changes in battery packs over the years. That's mm -hmm. obvious, right? Mm -hmm. We've gone from heavy lead acid batteries yeah. that added, you know, 40 pounds, 20, 30 something. kilograms yeah. to a bike to lithium iron battery packs. Mm -hmm. We've seen motors become more efficient. Back when I was at, at, at uh, university, we had 
friction-based mm -hmm. e-bikes where there was literally a motor that jammed onto the back wheel mm -hmm. and that's what spun the wheel and allowed you mm -hmm. to go on. Now we've got in-wheel motors. Obviously you're here mm -hmm. today uh, with your colleagues at Charge Bike and they've got this fantastic new yeah. uh, independent braking system, regenerative braking system for motors, and you are using their new motor, right? Uh, so, they, I mean, this is the first pilot motor put together in the days before the show, and we can't wait to bring this to market with them. Uh, one of the things, so over the course of the, you, you touched on this, there's so many different ways of mechanically linking the motor to the bike. In the early days, the friction drive was really popular because it allowed a high-speed motor to translate to the low RPM of the bike wheel, but of course it had enormous wear and losses. Um, the hub motors started to come into their own in the early 2000s, and they were a real game changer because now you had the whole package inside a wheel and the retrofit was simple there was no transmission to install or add to the bike you just swapped out a wheel and we've been proponents of hub motors ever since there's been a big trend towards thinking that mid drives is the best solution uh, but what the hub motor brings that you can't get with the mid drive setup is the option for regenerative braking and people really overlook to what extent braking and the brake maintenance is a constant cost and headache to the ownership of a bicycle and this is especially true with an e-bike or a cargo e-bike Bike. So I ride a cargo bike myself and I was replacing my disc brake pads about three times a year at a cost of about 30 to 40 dollars each time and that adds up to an annual cost of 100, 120 dollars not including all of my time fidgeting and replacing it which over the cost of say 10 years which is the lifespan of a typical battery amounts to more cost replacing brakes and I spend replacing my lithium battery pack. Um, so with a hub motor you can actually do 95 or more percent of that braking regeneratively without touching the mechanical wear on the pads but there's always been this trade-off where if you add a system with regen when you pedal the bike without the motor being used, you feel a little bit of drag because you have to be spinning the motor. And whenever the magnets move past the iron, there's a bit of drag. And that really is, especially for cycling purists, a little bit of a downer point to them. And so to finally have a technology that gives you the benefit of a fully freewheeling system and capturing 90% of your braking by regen could really change the game big time and really emphasize hub motors as the be all solution for most people's needs in the electric bike. I board. can't wait to see what you do with it when, you, when, you, when it gets into production and, and you're pushing it out. And I just, this collection blows me away. We've got unicycles, we've got yeah. penny farthings, we've got everything. And I hope this collection grows over the years as you add more unique vehicles to it. And I hope that, that we are going to see a real renaissance of cycling thanks to e-bikes and, and leaving those big, mm -hmm. big SUVs, big pickup trucks at home and using more Human personal scales. mobility yeah. solutions and also micro mobility and, and all of that. So yeah. thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope your final day at the show is, is as busy and as successful as the past two days have it's been. It's been a joy so far. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note below. You can reach out to us in the Discord chat room on Mastodon. Or if you are a Patreon supporter, Leave your comments there if you want more. Subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing charged up supporters. And shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. They are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hey Eska, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tazla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asenta, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hansley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen. Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watson, Will Graylin, and of course, the lovely Ian. We love Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday and Friday on this channel, plus Saturday for our News Roundup channel. And then on a Sunday, you'll see us over on Transport Evolve Take Two for our Chicken and Garden update and our Sunday musing. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you're enjoying this show. If you are here, I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. <laughs>